book of Hebrews talks about how God, don't turn there, I'm not going there. God at sundry times and diverse ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets and in these last days he has spoken to us through his son, Jesus. To that prophet of God to whom he spoke through, many different messages were proclaimed um, and in different ways, as the book of Hebrews opens by saying, to Elijah it was a still small voice. Uh, Jacob was not considered a prophet, but God came to him in a dream first. And Moses, who is referred to as a prophet, his first, um, his first encounter with God is at the bush that was not consumed. I'd say that that's a whole bunch of different ways. The message of the prophets, you could sum up always like this. Turn back to God. God has been trying to get the ear of those people who over the course of our Bible and through down to our time still have turned their back or they will not listen. I think people can get um, into a mindset that they forget something called progressive revelation. Jesus, in speaking to his disciples, he said, I have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. And that was when they were with him. They could only understand certain things after the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. So I believe in progressive revelation. I believe that when we start learning the Bible and we start to walk with God, we think we understand something a certain way. It's a little shaky at times. And then you take another step and it's a little bit more solid. And as you walk, maybe a year, maybe five years, maybe 10 years, and suddenly a greater revelation comes to the same truths that you've heard over and over again. How many know that's true? Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> so what I would say is that some of the people that we've looked at, some of the Bible personas we've looked at, they saw things that some of us won't see in our lifetime. God connected with them or communicated with them or through them in certain ways. We know, for example, Isaiah, he actually saw the Lord high and lifted up. It says in his book that in the year that King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord high and lifted up, saw a vision of that. We know that Zechariah, he saw further than any Old Testament prophet into what I would call apocalyptic visions. Um, the end of Zechariah speaks of a future time not yet accomplished, the thousand-year reign of Christ. And so each of these people received from God, most of the time, as I said, it was to call the people back. Sometimes it was a preachment of doom. Other times it was a message of comfort. If we are careful and we approach Scripture that same way, we'll realize that God is still speaking through those prophets to us today, although he's spoken to us through his son, it's through Christ in us that these scriptures come alive and we glean a new footing through them. I'm going to take you, as I said, to a very familiar passage. I don't want to apologize for it. I, I really do realize that after 11 years of ministry, um, and I've been trying to plow through the Bible and get some of your pages unstuck and get them nice and penned up, but I do realize the value in going back to what we've called God's repeatables, that the lesson is never learned. Even though we think we've learned something and we've gleaned and we've taken, we've summed up the whole story, the real test is in applying it in our lives. And when the tests and the trials come, we're not always that quick to switch into the gear of I know what to do, of what I've learned, of what I've been taught. So we're going to see if we are a little bit closer to making those applications in our life today. And for those newer folks, I'm going to say, I simply say to you, stick around, keep listening on the network. You will hear many of these messages repeated. This one is from Jeremiah 18 and the Potter's House. When I first heard Dr. Scott preach his message on the Potter's House, it was brand new to me. I'd never heard such a thing before. Um, I didn't know that through probably at least uh, 150 years of Bible preaching. There were great men of God, some of them Puritans, I mean a good variety of those who 
way before Dr. Scott's time, touched on the Potter's House, and it became clear to me that in every single generation, this message needs to be preached. I think, God forbid, we get into the mindset that we're so advanced in our thinking that we don't need to hear something over and over again. Dr. Scott also used to refer to Aaron Wilson, who, you know, they'd have these big camp meetings and whatnot, and most of the preachers, when they were asked to speak, they would usually save their best, you know, they'd get their best sermon out, and it was an attempt to obviously stir the hearers, but also there was a bunch of preachers there. So a lot of times you saved your, your gem so that all the preachers could be wooed. And I remember Dr. Scott telling a story about Aaron Wilson. He was at a camp meeting three days. They asked him the first night what he was preaching on. He said whatever his subject was. And the first night was met with great applause and reception. He was asked the second day what he was going to preach on. He said he was going to preach on the same thing he preached on the first night. A little less enthusiastic. And the third day he was asked what he was going to preach on. He said he was going to preach on the same message the first and the second day that he preached because he understood the principle. Very few people can get it the first time. And if you're lucky, if you're lucky to have something repeated to you 20 times, 30 times, 50 times, 100 times, which is why I say tune into the website 24 hours a day. And although we have, we have programmers who program, these are the staples that make up the fabric for those people who live the life of faith. You need these messages. So there are a few things before the lesson um, that I would like to just kind of put into your minds. Um, it's somewhat interesting that when you read this Jeremiah 18, um, there's a couple things we, we assume. It starts off with the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying. We don't know what Jeremiah was doing when the Lord spoke to him. We have no clue. We don't know if he was laying on his back, sunning his face, or whether he was slinging some rocks at somebody, but just says that God spoke to him and said, Arise, go down to the potter's house. And I want you to notice something. It says, There I will cause thee to hear my words. Uh, I was translating from the Hebrew, I will let you hear my words. Same difference, but I want you to notice there's no beat that's missed. Then I went down to the potter's house. There are a few things that are always assumed. One, that Jeremiah did not consult with the deacon board. He did not go ask people if they'd like to come with him. Or let me say it in a New Testament way, like the Apostle Paul, he conferred not with flesh and blood, but heard the voice of the Lord and went obediently, which is something that's always very interesting. He went, and not only did he go, but he knew where to go. And listen to the disciples in the New Testament when they're asking, you know, we don't even know where you're going. How do we know the way, right? He knew where to go. However that is, I don't know. I've always been puzzled by that. He, he knew where the potter's house was. Um, and then I want us to kind of enter into that state with him. He says, he went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. Um, both, I think Dr. Scott was influenced by G. Campbell Morgan. He was not wrong in implying that it's not just some random thing, but his work. The potter was working his work on the wheels, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. Now we know right now, Jeremiah sees the potter, his wheel, and the vessel. Now, let me just stop right there and talk about the marred part of this, because this is another thing that's always puzzled me. Some of you know I study language, and there cannot be such a familiarity that you just say, I can't look, and I had to look at what kind of marness this was, you know, to say the vessel that he was making was marred in the hand of the potter. And this is what's so interesting. In the book of Jeremiah, this word mar, marred will reoccur over and over again. Some of you are a little bit too young to remember, but I once taught a message on the marred girdle out of Jeremiah. It's in the, it's in the book. <laughs> you heard it. And the idea there is that it said it was marred and profitable for nothing. But it was marred, by the way, at the hand of the prophet, putting it, hiding it somewhere to, to where it became dirtied. And I started to think, does this marred word carry just one meaning? But in fact, it, it covers a whole series of things. Um, so the Hebrew word to decay, to ruin, 
to batter, to cast off, corrupt, destroy, lose, mar, or perish. And you will find the first time this word is used in the Hebrew will be in Genesis 6, when in Genesis 6, 11, the earth was corrupt. There's your word uh, before God, for all flesh ha had been corrupted in its way on earth. And then God says he will destroy the earth with a flood, the impending doom of the flood. So you get the idea um, of that type of marred. Um, equally, the word is used when Lot is surveying the Jordan Valley, and God says, this will be the fate, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. You've got the idea. It can carry with it um, by the hand of Jeremiah. The girdle was marred by the hand of God. A population was wiped out. So when it says marred in the hand of the potter, I don't want us to just think, ooh, you know, like a, a little chip. We're talking about something massive. Enough to say that if you and I were sitting at the wheel, we would probably want to fling away whatever we were working on to start over. And I'm talking about fling it away and out the door. Luckily, we're not dealing with that. It says here, as the clay was marred in the, pot, in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Now, I want you to, I want you to see something. In all the years and in all the messages, it was the first time I read this and it dawned on me, that God hasn't even opened up his mouth yet. The, the prophet is just standing and seeing the spectacle of the potter, the wheel, and the clay. The message, the message that's spoken to the prophet is this. Then the word of the Lord, remember he said, I'll cause you to hear my words. Well, here are the words. He was looking at something, which I want us to go back and look at in a minute, but these are the words that God spoke to the prophet saying, O oh, house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in mine hand, O oh, house of Israel. That's the message. We tend to always think, we'll go to the potter's house and we'll describe what's there, and I want to do that. But the message that was spoken to the prophet, where he's told to go down to the potter's house, there I'll cause you to hear my words, and these are the words. Am I not able to do with you as this clay? Now, for those people who uh, are students here and have read and read and read, you probably have uh, words in the margin of your Bible. And I'm, I'm not so sure that I want to camp out immediately on the words. I may reference them, but I want to say this to you. If at any time somebody says, well, what's the stuff that God works with? You've got to go back to the beginning, because in the beginning when when it's declared in the book of Genesis, let us make Adam in our image. And it says that God formed Adam from the dust of the ground. And Psalm 103 says, he remembereth our frame, that we are but dust. I want you to think of that realm. No color, no gender, no age restriction here. God, you know, talk about God having an all-inclusive plan. Here it is. Clay is clay, dirt is dirt. Would you like me to say that again? Some of you look like you're asleep. Clay is clay and dirt is dirt. Now, it, it really does jar the mind and most people who would probably rebel against this concept because it is a difficult one to grab hold of. Um, the fact that God is sovereign and in control. Now, I'll tell you what, for, for most people, no doctrine is more despised to the carnal mind than this, that God calls the shots. And I'll say this to you because I'm standing here as a testimony of that. I, I fought God for a long time, and many of you fought God for a long time. You know, some people think that when you start talking about the divine will of God and God's sovereignty in your life, suddenly a wave of fear. Oh, I will lose my identity. I will not be myself anymore. That's the carnal mind and the flesh speaking that has no clue, by the way. Everybody has that mouth moment. You have no clue of what you're saying. The reality is, and this is the reality of this, beginning with the first message of this particular section of the Bible that we're looking at, a principle, God's the boss. Now, I'm going to ask you something. This ministry has 41 years. 
behind it. I'm not talking about the years before Dr. Scott. I'm talking from 1975 until the present. With lots of those messages having played, are you old timers any closer? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> are you any closer to the recognition that God is the boss and he's in control? Don't raise your hand. Because even our mouths may say something, but the reality is we have this tendency. How many, again, don't raise your hand. How many have prayed in your prayer closet, Lord, if you could just work out your will in my life, and then suddenly the will of God comes, and you are exactly like Jonah finding a ship for Tarshish, right? <laughs> Pray the prayer, oh, Lord, let this be heavenly Father, and it's like God saying, okay. And then here comes the first moment of truth when God is possibly bringing this to pass and you cannot see because you cannot see his sovereign hand in whatever's going on, and you turn the other way. And I'm not going to point the finger at you because I've done that. I've been guilty of praying and asking for something, and I'm sure it was God's deliverance and his sovereignty and his design and his divine will carrying out something, but in the moment it was happening, I couldn't see it. Now, is that true of anybody here in this room? No, okay, it's about five people raised their hand. <laughs> now, unfortunately, when I, when I go down this pathway, there may be some people who may be less pleased with me, but I, I have to just say this. Um, most of what rules today in churches, in schools, social media is probably the worst for it, is the self-centeredness. Everything revolves around me. It's all for me, designed for me. I, I look at some of our King's kids and I think to myself, the, the goodness of God, and some that have been in, sitting in the sanctuary now for years, the goodness of God to have some of you know that you don't have to conform. You're not obliged to conform to the club called the world. And being different, by the way, um, yeah, it may cause you some harm as you grow up, but eventually God works it out so that different is actually good. And, I'm a, I'm a product of that. I, I think to myself, I wouldn't want to be growing up in a time where people are so focused on things like bullying. And when I was a kid, you got bullied, and you either learned how to fight back, or you took it silently, and you, when you, you came through it at some point. And at some point, you grew to the age of being a little bit bigger than some of the other kids, and you realized, OK, now what are they going to do? You got through it. I'm saying that for a reason. I'm glad that I'm not in that generation, but I'm telling some of our young people today, don't worry about being different. Don't worry about if somebody says, well, that's just not the way it's done, or we do it this way, or this is, this is how it's cool. Well, when I'm going to stand here and tell you that God's way is, is not cool, God's way is the way, uh, if it happens to be cool, that's fine, but um, the concept that God is the boss is the thing I want to hit on, because too often I hear people in circles when I travel say, I accepted the Lord, I found God, and I always know that they have not been reading the scriptures because there are certain scriptures that say just point blank. Christ speaking to his disciples, he says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And if you want to look in some other places, Ephesians says we were chosen out from among others that weren't chosen. I could start picking the scriptures. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9 says you are a chosen generation. Chose. He chose you. Now, forgive me because I'm going to go down this path. I said, I would, I, you know, you pray about something. But when you get that clear in your mind that he chose you and you're no longer thinking of yourself as an accident, I spent many years thinking of myself just like that, that this had, to be an, this had to be some mistake. But he chose me, and he chose you. And when you settle that, something great happens. I'm not saying that you're going to start giving way to the boss sooner, because I don't believe that. That flesh nature is still going to want to fight God. But recognition of he chose me, ownership. We talk about, and I hear people always talk about this, the kingdom of God. Well, the kingdom of God means there's a king, and if there's a king, it means that, like just the Bible says, every knee shall bow. He's the king. We bow to him. Or I've heard the evangelist say, make him lord of your life, but just keep, you know, you keep doing what you're doing, though. Make him lord of your life today. Ah, you know, 
church falls on Sunday and softball games are more important. You see what I'm saying. There's always a contradiction. For me, it's quite simple. Has the lesson of God's sovereignty, God being the boss, sunk in a little bit more? We just entered into 2016. But for anybody here that has been on this journey any amount of time, you know what it is. You take a couple of steps thinking, okay, God's the boss, he's in control. And then something happens and you go, God, what are you doing, right? And you take another few steps and God's in control. Praise God, he's in control. And then, so that's the whole journey. That's the whole Christian walk. It's almost like anybody looking in on this would say, wow, those people are crazy. But that's the whole journey. Now, you know, this Bible passage tells me something else. When I talk about God being the boss and he can do whatever he wants, that includes deciding who he saves. Now, there's no restriction. Christ said anyone can come unto him. But through the Bible, we read about God, God saying, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. We see many times over how God is saying, this my favorite people, Israel, and yet they are the rebellious bunch. In fact, at some point through the mouth of the prophet Hosea, he says, they are to be called not my people, right? But then he still wanted to save his not my people, right? So you can understand it's like saying when God loves, and he does love his creation, he wants to see his creation on the journey, on the path that he designed. But we have free will. We can do whatever we want, including, by the way, talking back to God. And I'm not going to ask if any of you have ever done that before. <laughs> I don't have a word of knowledge, but I do have the gift of knowing how carnal and human we are. So, as I said, this is a tough sell to tell somebody, especially for newer folks, that we're talking about a principle. The principle is God is the boss. Now, when I first started in this Christian walk, in my faith, I came in with the idea that although I heard God is the boss, I still thought I was doing things and I was I, I, I. It took a long time to settle in that God has a plan and a purpose and he is not going to let me just flip around, nor is he going to give me the red carpet and say, okay, here now, it's so perfectly clear. Here's a neon carpet. Walk on it. He says, here's my word, and here's my son walking in this way, walking in Christ, but that does not protect from me following off the path or going astray or you going astray. So when we talk about God being the boss, we're not talking about God being a bully and saying, you will do this and not that, because in reality we know even though we have had the word declared to us, and you can say, yes, I know the word, you may still go out and walk off the path. And this is the beauty of that message, that in terms of God's sovereignty, I think when the Apostle Paul picks up in the ninth chapter of Romans this very same concept about the clay and God the potter. I think there was something that the Apostle Paul knew, the argument on the part of people who may have heard and received the gospel and then turned around and said, now, hey, wait a minute. Uh, are you sure you want to be talking to those people over there? Because maybe they shouldn't be in this group you're talking to. And obviously, Paul turns around and uses this very same analogy. Uh, I think the psalmist in Psalm 50 and verse 21, and I picked a very strange translation for this. Uh, you thought I was just like you, is what one, in, one translation says. You thought, God speaking, I was just like you, but I'm not. We read elsewhere, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. And every time I, I look into the Bible, I think to myself, thank God that God has revealed himself as sovereign, that when we are told, and I've repeated this Many times through my ministry these 11 years, seek ye first the kingdom of God, we're talking about kingdom of God, meaning there is a king, there is a sovereign Lord over all, and it's not self-centered in what pleases me and what will work for me, which is what this generation has been steeped in. This generation has become the avoid pressure, when in fact that is the antithesis of what we're told we want to have 
the pressure of God's touch on our life, knowing that he is in control. He's the boss. So if you've got something to write in your Bible, if you don't have the word principle, put it there in the margin, because that's the first principle. God's the boss. Secondly, what is the purpose? And I have three subheadings under the purpose. One, that every man or woman, being the offspring of Adam, in the sight of God is marred clay. How many have heard the saying, I'm basically a good person? That's failure to recognize someone who has not been taught. A marred piece of clay is a marred piece of clay. Do not call it something else. It's marred. Denominations have fractured over this one point. Original sin? Oh, if you're a searcher, if you're somebody out there listening to me, you say, well, I'm really searching and I don't know what to believe. If you go back into the Reformed tradition, the total depravity of man, which was preached, is not too far from the reality. If a person is reading this book, you realize that in terms of 66 books, three tell us of the perfection of God's creation. The rest of the book, of the 66 book, books, are the journey back in God's unfolding plan of redemption. And the last chapter or two of the book of Revelation tell us about the perfection that God will bring when heaven is descended on earth, new heavens and new earths, as Peter, Second Peter calls it, are complete. Too much time is spent on trying to figure out how to convince people that they are not clay. Now, think about this. God could have come in the flesh. He could have come in another method. How did Jesus Christ come to earth in clay? And this is what's so staggering. When people want a war and denominations fight over, why the clay? Here is the clay so that we could recognize, we could see, we could behold his glory. Now, if you think I'm too far off the mark, I don't care. I realize one thing. It's a difficult message. We are all clay. I love what Paul says in the New Testament. He says, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. I want you to think about all this because from, we go from the principle to the purpose, and under this subheading is the recognition of the, the marred clay. The second part of this purpose is the need to be made again. So much of the New Testament talks about the new creation in Christ. I meet people almost every single week who have had a hard life, something that has happened that has cataclysm, cataclysmically affected their whole entire being. But nothing could change a life, I've said this before, than an encounter with the risen Christ in God's book. And there you find, just like Nicodemus coming to Jesus at nighttime and asking the question about how it is made possible. And Jesus says, quite frankly, you must be born again. You must be born from above. And Nicodemus asked the question of the ages. How can a man be born again? Is he supposed to go back into his mother's womb? How is this possible? Now, for the carnal mind and the natural mind, we'd all be asking the question the same way. What is Jesus talking about? But he's talking about receiving from above. And the purpose falls into that. If we are marred clay, then we need to be made again, renewed, recreated. That is why we are supposedly being remade in the image and likeness of Christ as he works on us. And that brings me to the third point. I said three subheadings, that God doesn't change, but we do. And sometimes not all the changes are for the better. I think the more we will to change without Christ, the worse we become. And I'm going to say that again because there'll be people who will twist my words. The more we will to change without Christ, the worse we become, because the more we become dependent on the flesh, the less God dependency to change and break a nature. Somebody said to me, Pastor, how does a person get delivered from something? We were specifically talking about the bondage of addiction, whatever form that was. And I said, well, you can't do it by will worship. That'll never work. How many have tried to do something by mere, come on, 
by mere, I, I will. Okay, keep your hands up if it worked. <laughs> the jury's in, folks. So what I'm saying to you is this is why when we talk about the purpose, it's necessary to kind of go down the pathway of something. I've ha heard the argument many times before, well, if God is working this out and he has a principle, which is he's the boss and he's got a purpose that he's working out, do I have to come to church for him to work out that purpose? And I will say to you, in all sincerity, coming to church doesn't make you a Christian, but standing and listening to someone open up the word of God and bring life and light to the meaning on the pages has great value to it. This is why Paul in Ephesians said, God gave some prophets, some evangelists, some pastoring teachers for the perfecting of the saints to the work of the ministry for a purpose. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the perfect man. And that, it's very hard to find people who on their own can come to that. This is why God gave gifts to the church. So there's a purpose being worked out, and that purpose is to bring you into Christ likeness. Now, just because somebody has fallen doesn't mean that they cannot be conformed. In fact, I'd say to you, the best transformations are those people who've had a couple of hard falls. You know, it's, it's one thing when you, you're born into a certain lifestyle and you've never known a day of tragedy and you've never known a day of sorrow and you Maybe, I don't know, God bless you, but then no. I pray that each and every person know what it is to have the tools that make and forge the faith that comes only by what? By the hard falls. And I don't pray that happens to somebody, but at the same time, paradoxically, there's no other way to know the restoration and the grace of God without the hard falls. I think about people who uh, were in God's purpose. They were in God's plan. And God didn't just say, okay, now go out and do this thing and have success. You can be successful. I'm not saying you can't be in God's plan successful, but I want you to think, before we talk about us, let's talk about a few people who God had a purpose for, a design for. Let's take Moses. Born of a Hebrew family of a Hebrew slave, and basically we know the story of Moses is told in Exodus 3, taken care of by Pharaoh's daughter, raised in the palaces of Egypt, and then after an event, flees into the desert of Midian, spends 40 years on the backside of the desert, and I think those 40 years were not just looking at sheep. I think those 40 years were 40 years of God turning and turning and turning the life of Moses. Forty years of turning to when the time was right in the encounter at the burning bush, that man's pride, the pride that was lifted in Egypt, was humbled under his feet, that he removed his shoes, knowing in whose presence he stood. Now, this, that does not mean that then God said, now I've spoken to you from the bush and you are perfected. It simply meant that was the beginning. And there would be many humbling hard falls for Moses, including standing before Pharaoh and including dealing with the children of Israel an additional 40 years. Oh, my goodness. You know, you know, it wasn't bad enough that he had what he had in the desert for 40 years, but now 40 years with these people? Are you kidding me? So what I'm saying to you is God will use all of these things, but he had a purpose for Moses. Moses' purpose was to deliver the children of Israel. He was the deliverer. Did he accomplish that purpose for God's sake? Yes. But did he accomplish it perfectly? No. And we're talking, this is why I love God's book, because it shows the humanity, the humanness of every single person in here that, yes, they messed up. I can think another one that reminds me of God's calling somebody is the prophet Elijah. And think about it. I mean, if you're Elijah, you think if God's going to speak to you and God's going to call you and God's going to say, now you go and do this thing over here, that you're going to be carried like a royalty. You know, people are going to carry your chair and you're going to be popping the grapes in your mouth and go a little faster, a little slower, right? Now, go to a brook. The birds will feed you there. And then the brook dried up. Now go and get fed by a widow woman. Hello, God, really? 
But this was a purpose that God unfolding in Elijah's life, and I could pick any place in God's book and say, if you're not sure, some of you who wrestle with this, what is God's will? Do I have a purpose in my life? Take a look at these people first and recognize that God had a purpose and a design for their life, and it wasn't to roll out a, a smooth mat and say, okay, now go. Each one of these had some hard falls. There could be no greater testimony to the concept of principle and purpose than Simon Peter. And when we talk about someone who had been with the Lord, go back to my text here, the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. I can't think of anything more marred in the hand of the potter than the person of Simon Peter who was with Christ. Christ said, you will deny me, and he did. And it's that hard fall. Christ said, I prayed for you that your faith fail not, your faith not be eclipsed, but when you, when you come back, when you're strengthened, you go back and you strengthen your brothers. It's his message on the day of Pentecost, not Peter's eloquence, the Spirit of God. And that's why I said sometimes it's these hard knocks in life that are needed. Quit trying to say, God, if you'll just spare me from this thing. If I had a penny, a dime, a dollar for every time I said, Lord, oh, mm, oh no. So don't, don't think I'm telling you this because I've overcome the urge to say, Lord, spare me from this. Oh, I've many times said, Lord, if it's possible, let this thing pass from me. And God, I'm sure, not that I heard him audibly, said, nevertheless, <laughs> right. So it is what it is. I, I think that too many times our urge is to not see the purpose. Job said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. And that's true. We can get in the way of it. We can make a mess of it. Satan can come and make a mess of it. But I just want you to be mindful of the fact that God, he's got a plan. And I think too many times we wander around aimlessly. Do you want to know what's wrong with the church today? And I'm not just speaking of this church, I'm speaking of most churches. Most people don't understand what the purpose is. They think they are saved for themselves. They don't understand the concept of what I just quoted out of Ephesians, saved for something, till we all come to the unity of the faith. How do you do that? You've got to be in Christ. You've got to be faithing and trusting in Christ. And how does faith come? Hearing. And what? Hearing the word of God. It's not, you know, it's, it's not difficult, but it becomes challenging when people forget why they have been saved. You've been saved, plucked out for a purpose. Now, you can't always know. I've, I, I told you, people will ask me all the time, I really want to know what God's will is in my life. And the first question I'll ask them is have you read the 66 books of the Bible, even the ones that shouldn't, you know, we kind of say are dubious. Have you read them all? Because somewhere in there, you're going to find yourself. Somewhere in these 66 books will be like a mirror, and you'll be looking at it saying, okay, I'm asking for something that maybe is kind of not what I should be asking for. God said if we ask, he'll give us what we need. Many times we ask for something that's not even in the realm of need. It's over and beyond and outside. So come back to here. Principle, purpose, and let me just say one thing about purpose, one last thing. Um, Philippians 2 says that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. I wish someone would quote the, the verse that comes after that, which is, do all things without murmuring and disputings. In other words, as God is helping you work out the things in your life, be a little bit more cognizant of the fact that uncomfortable though it may be, you and I have not resisted unto blood. We're nowhere near the Apostle Paul and Silas being cast into prison, shackled, laying with rats crawling all over us. Our, our uncomfortableness, most of the time, by the way, at the depth of things stems from Poverty. I'm not talking about poverty in spirit. I'm talking about tangible poverty. And please, nobody better say to me, what do I know about that? Because I know much about it. I've been there. But most of it comes from poverty. 
And when we, when we are in a state of destitution, we tend to think that there's, there's just no handle to get out. There's no way to escape that bottomless pit. And for those of you who are in the state today listening to me, find the passage in Deuteronomy that says God is underneath bottomless. You have not fallen so far down that God's arms are not able to catch you and stop the fall. And the minute you become cognizant of the fact that he is there and his arms are there and he is present and the fall is stopped, at least there's no plunging even further. I think too many times we take silly pills. We know what the word says and then, huh? Oh, what's that? So, we have principle, purpose. Now let's talk about the process. And I think the process is pretty simple. The process is your life. When we talk about what Jeremiah saw. He saw the potter working at the wheel on his clay, on his, the vessel. Now the wheel, the wheel may be, let's say it this way. If the wheel is centered, doesn't matter how big or how small the wheel is, if the wheel is centered, then whatever is put down, splatted down, plopped down, smacked down, as long as the wheel is centered and what's placed on the wheel is centered, no matter how out of shapeliness it might look, it'll work out okay. The centeredness is Christ. While you are spinning out of control, you think, on your wheel, because God could not be working this darn thing, right? The speed. You notice, I don't know if it's me, and it could be me, it could be that I just drank too much coffee in my life, but you notice how things seem to be speeding up and they're getting faster and faster. Anybody notice that? But by golly gee, when you were, when I was a teenager, it was like every single day was like molasses. A second would take forever. How many know what I'm talking about? You know, you wonderful kids, enjoy. Don't grow up too fast. But if you're like me, I know that my wheel has just gone sometimes on overdrive. I think about this church. You could not get more thrown into something. And you talk about, keep the image of clay. You could not get more thrown into something than me. It was, it was as if I came in and I, I saw a wheel a beautiful wheel, and I saw a potter, and I saw all that, and all of a sudden it was like, okay. Whoosh. But that was me being thrown onto the wheel, and suddenly everything's spinning out of control. You know, I, one time, silly me, probably about five or ten years ago, somebody said if I would go to Disneyland, they gave me tickets. I, I don't like theme parks. Um, that's just my personal preference. I'd prefer to have a theme park in a book or something, you know, it's safer. But, <laughs> Um, somebody said, we go on the roller coaster. And I said, well, I, don't, I guess so, I don't know. You know when you're, when you're on something that's moving that quickly, there's really only about one thing you can do. Ah! Right? That's all you can do. You know you're trapped in that contraption. You cannot move anywhere. You're strapped in. You might as well scream your lungs out. And that's kind of what 11 years have been like in church. <laughs> No, 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 no. Lest I, the spirit of exaggeration has come over me. But what I want to say is that it has felt sometimes like it's been out of control. And just when you think, listen carefully what I'm going to say, just when you think you have things under control, did you hear what I just said? Just when you think you have things under control, what, what does that tell you? You're forgetting who is in control. He knows what I'm able to bear. This is the funny thing. He knows that I'm able to stand up under the pressure. So he applies a little bit more pressure. I'm on that wheel, and a little bit more is applied. And I'm thinking, if there's any more pressure, I'm going to break. I'm going to crack. And I'm sure God's going, ah, nah, stop complaining. It's, you know, if you stop and think about it, the more pressure that's put on you, you have to think of it this way. The things that, and Dr. Scott was right about this, the things that you thought a couple of years ago would have killed you now breeze through like nothing. Am I right? 
this is what happens. Those faith muscles and fortitude now, because you've, you, you've now developed the faith muscles to trust God, even though it lapses at times. And suddenly you find out that well, God, God knows I'm able. Well, you, only, you might only say that afterward. Like God knew. Yeah, God knew. While the wheel was going so fast and the pressure was unbearable. But as long as you were in the center of the wheel, it doesn't matter. And I think about what John Wright Follett said. He said, trouble is a servant. Now, you know what? May God help us all to understand that. That concept of whatever pressures, whatever troubles, it does not matter whether you brought them upon yourself or whether God's bringing them on. It does not matter. The idea is if God is the boss and if he has a purpose, then the pressure and the speed, everything in your life has a bearing and a purpose. And as long as the life is centered in Christ, no matter what else is going on, you're going to make it. Not only are you going to make it, you're going to be okay. You may not think so, but you're going to be okay. Now, I'm, I'm not preaching to me today. I'm preaching to you. Sometimes I preach these messages to me, but I think I've spent 11 years going, whoo, right? <laughs> And I don't think it's going to slow down anytime soon. So here's what I'd say to you. The temptation is this. At some point you think, will I get to a certain age ha, where it will stop? Will I get to a certain maturity where there won't be any more pressure? Will I get to a certain point where and the answer is no, no, and no. Just settle it right away. You know. To whom much is given, much is required. And I think a lot of times we think of that as only applying to the minister. Oh, no, 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 friends. To whom much is given, much is required. The patience that God has towards his creation to put up with us constantly. Ooh! And he's just spinning away. Now, luckily, God's not into rap. He doesn't go like that. He doesn't do that. It's always going in this direction or in that direction and not halfway in between, right? Thank God for that because we have a lot of whiplash in the kingdom. Is it going too fast for you? You don't know how to answer that one, right? Because if you say yes, it might get, he might speed it up some more, right? Oh, God, I like this pace. <laughs> right? Just like that. So we have the principle, the purpose, the process, and ultimately the person. And that's really where I want to end, the note I would like to end on, because ultimately it makes me shake my head every time I look at this message to understand God's patience and his long-suffering with me. Now, if any of you have been married, say, more than 20 years, you know what it is to have patience. I don't care if you still love each other very much, you know what, that's a godly type of patience, right? Where you just kind of... <sighs> so multiply that by a bazillion. That's how God looks on us. And I'm thinking, the patience that God has with me and the long-suffering. And I include myself in a host of people who think they have made a shipwreck of their lives. They've fallen down too many times. I'm looking at a couple of people in this room who've fallen down more than once in the time I've been here. And the difficulty sometimes of recognizing God, God hasn't taken his hand off of you. You just have that momentary lapse of, wow, I failed, and now I've got to I gotta remove myself, I gotta take myself out of the, the equation. And God's probably saying, uh -huh, not so fast, I'm not done with you. When I think of God's patience, when I think of this particular passage, I think about the God man relationship. I think about the impossibility. Back in Genesis, when it says from the Hebrew, the one being potter, the one who fashioned and created it all, who would even deign to put his life in me, and that's the staggering thing. And yet, I'm going to do exactly what is said, the message of Jeremiah to the house of Israel. Can I not do with you as this potter? It seems kind of silly to be asking the question if I know I've just painted the picture of the whole lesson. God the person is not like perhaps in Martin Luther's day before he read the Bible, 
some unjust judge waiting to punish and mete out, but rather, if you think about it, not only first God of all power, God Almighty, but has to be a God of infinite love and mercy because there's no way that God being God with all power, being all powerful, could not also be a God of incredible infinite love to pour out as he has on vessels like me and like you. So when I think about God the person, I think about the things that are said in 1 John, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart because he knows all things, that at a time when we think, what will God think of this? I always say, as long as you are still thinking of God, the person says, is there a time when I will have complained too much, I will have, I will have gestured too much, I will have vocally expressed my displeasure too much, and I, I always say the same thing, as long as you are still looking unto him who is the author and finisher of faith, he's the architect of faith, as long as you're still looking to him, and no matter how many times you think your failures will prohibit you, I want you to go back in the book and take a look at all of these men, including Jeremiah. Jeremiah does not have the perfect and pristine life. While he's carrying out the message of God, while he's carrying out the purpose of God, while he's carrying out and part of the process of telling the people they need to turn back, don't go to Egypt, don't go here, look out for this, turn back. They throw him into a pit. Talk about injustice, thrown into a pit for preaching God's word. And you think you have problems? And I love what he did. He said, I'm going to send money to buy a field in Anathoth as, a, as a, a token to say the people will go back. There will be life again. And I say, that is the same God that I serve, the same God that heard that prayer, that was faithful to listen to the prophet's word, see his heart, and did not bring him to the precipice where he was not able. Now, when I talk about this, sometimes I think some, some people may shake their head and say, I, I don't really understand the poetry of what you're saying, but I'll say it like this. If we live, as Romans says, that the same power that raised up Christ from the dead dwells in us, then that power is enough to keep our eyes as, as, as our wheel is out of control, as things are impossible. That implant is enough to keep my eyes focused on him no matter what else is going on, how fast, how slow, how crazy to know he cares about me. Last week, I spent many hours trying to convey this message that God really loves his people. I don't know that we always express our love or our thanksgiving to him, but that's the God we serve. He, through this book, we have a demonstration of his fidelity from cover to cover, right until the end of the book of Revelation, when it talks about the only one who could open up the seals, it was the Lamb of God. The only one who still came and comes to return with his saints, that is God, Lord Jesus, King of Kings, returning with his people, with the saints. So the minute you and I get it straight that the person of God is not against you, the lament of so many voices I've heard, well, if God is for me, why is he letting this thing happened to me. And I, I say, listen, you can't say all the tragedies in life. You cannot say all of the tragedies are God enters in to work his good. God will work it out. You cannot say that for everything, can you? Well, most of the people say, no, that's right. But I would say to you, even the greatest of tragedies, for it's not my pleasure to say this, but it's a, truth, a truthful statement that God knew in the moment of Dr. Scott's death, of his sickness and his death, prepared in the heart, understanding what I could not see, that God would make a way, and in the testing and in the tragedy, God opened up a blessing. In fact, I'd say this to you, in Dr. Scott's sickness, when he came to preach to you, it was exactly the embodiment of Psalm 84, blessed men go through valleys of weeping. He made it a place of springs for you and I to drink from, to, to be quickened by, to see that man's faith in action. And I'd say the same thing here. The tragedy of a loss of life, which is heaven's gain. But nevertheless, God entered into that. Faithful, faithful God. So when we talk about the person, the one being potter, I'd simply say this to you for those people 
in the sound of my voice today who feel like you are bent out of shape. You've just about had all the swirling, whirling, and splatting that you can take. Well, if God decides to pick you up again and slap you down another time on the wheel, just remember one thing. It's those nail-pierced hands and the eyes of an attentive, omniscient, and omnipotent God who is in communication, in relation with your troubles of your life, with your heartbreaks, with your happiness, with your family, with your household. So when you step away from all this, you really can say, God is in control. God will work out his purpose in my life. Even though I have sometimes thwarted it, he will work it out. Why? Because God has a design. He's not going to force me. He's not going to force you and say, come on now, if you don't do it. But he will keep guiding. And as long as we are looking unto him, he'll take you all the way through. The last picture that's not in this potter's house is the fire that's required to set the clay. And I remember telling, sharing with some of you of that beautiful picture when you see something that's finished. Well, guess what? I'll say this to you. This, this clay is still being worked on. And the fiery trials that come are to, I've said this, de-drossify, to really show what is true faith versus what is just the whatever portion of my life. But there will be a day for me and there will be a day for you when the final setting occurs. And this is why the Bible says, Paul was saying, his goal was to present those perfect without spot or blemish. That's when it is finished. That's when we have made our journey, the last of the trials and firing occurs, and we become the treasures, which we, we are right now, but we, we become the final form of the treasures that God has had his eye on this whole time. So I don't know if there's anybody here today that needed to be reminded of God's love and God's care, but God has a purpose for your life, and you may be out of shape and out of, out of the spinning and the cycling of everything, just don't lose track on the one who cares about you and his attention to your life, to your life dedicated to him should be pre preeminently what matters most, not the circumstances. They will bring you, by the way, to greater and increasing faith if you'll just keep looking unto him who is the great potter. That's my message. Come on. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.